Do you currently have a tennis ball hanging from a string in your garage? Or maybe a driver who can't seem to park the car in the same spot twice? Well, if so, you can take a low-cost ESP8266, a short strip of LED pixels, add a couple of parts, and build an LED parking assistant for your garage. This low-cost and easy-to-build system also contains a simple web interface for controlling all the options and settings, and if you're a Home Assistant user, you can add MQTT to also use the system as a vehicle presence detector. Hi and welcome to Resin Chem Tech. A little over three years ago, I built my first parking assistant for my wife. Now while this system has held up well and still works today, it wasn't the easiest to build. It involved a Raspberry Pi, a LED matrix, a lot of wiring, a USB to UART converter, two different power supplies, and to top it all off, anytime you needed to make a change to the settings, you actually had to stop the system, open up the Python code, find the settings, change those settings, restart the Python program to get it back up and running again. So I wanted to see if I could take what I've learned about the ESP8266 and about LED pixel strips and see if I could build a new version of the parking assistant that was much lower cost, was much easier to build, but more importantly, had a web interface where I could easily make changes to the settings and options without having to edit any code. So like many of my recent projects, let me first show you the end result and some of the features and options before we get into talking about the parts and some of the build processes. So you kind of got a feel for what the completed system looks like in the opening part of this video, but let's take a little closer look at some of the additional features that are available in the parking system. Now the parking system consists of four different parking zones. At the outermost level is the wake zone. That's the first zone that the car will enter and that will wake the system up from standby. And then it enters the active zone. That's where it's providing that countdown effect. And then when it hits the park zone, that is the desired final resting spot of the car. Now if the driver actually happens to pull a little too far forward, then it enters the backup zone at which point the LEDs will rapidly flash. Now for each of these zones, you can set the distance of where the zone begins and the width of each one. In addition, you can also specify your own color for each of those different zones. In addition, that active zone or that countdown zone has a number of different effects available to choose from. Now the effect you saw at the beginning starts at each edge of the LED strip and meets in the middle. You can also flip that around and have it start at the middle and work its way to the outside edge or you can have it begin at one end of the strip all the way to the other and of course the reverse of that going back the other direction. Now these last couple of effects could be handy in the event that you need to install your LED strip vertically on something like a post or a column. In addition to colors and effects, the web application also allows you to set up a number of other options and settings. You can specify the number of LEDs in your install, and while the application actually supports up to 100, I would say somewhere between 20 and 40 is kind of the ideal range. You also specify the brightness of your LEDs when they're active and tracking a car, and the brightness of the LEDs when they're in standby. Now in standby or sleep mode, by default, the uh, one pixel in each end is lit up, normally in a very dim color, uh, to let you know the system is in standby. If you don't want to use that feature, that's fine. You can disable it by simply entering a brightness of zero here. Now, if you happen to have an MQTT broker and using something like Home Assistant, you can enable that within the Parking Assistant and use the system for vehicle presence. When it's enabled, the system will let you know whether a car is present or not present and will also report the current measured distance that you can use in your automations. MQTT is not required and you can enable or disable it at any time through the web application. And finally, there are a few additional commands you can use or issue from the web application. You can simply reboot or restart the controller. You can wipe out all of your settings and start all over from scratch, or you can actually apply firmware upgrades through the web application over the air. So that'll do it for the quick high level overview. Information on the web application, all the settings and options, including instructions on how to install the firmware can be found in the GitHub Wiki where the firmware is also located. And there'll be a link to that down in the video description. For those of you that are interested, now I'm gonna move on to kind of an overview of the build process, including 
my selection of a distance sensor, which is very important to this project. So here are the primary components we're going to use in this project. Starting out, I'm going to use my favorite microcontroller, the Wemos D1 Mini. I'm going to add a logic level shifter to shift that voltage up for my LED strip. And I've talked about this in the past, but we're probably really going to need that here because depending on how we install this in the garage, we may have a significant wiring run between the controller and the start of the LEDs. If you want to know more about why I always use a logic level shifter, I'll throw a link to the video up in the corner and down in the video description. But of course, we're going to need uh, LED strips. I'm using WS2812B, 60 pixels per meter, and I'm going to be using about 36 pixels. That will fit nicely in about a two foot run of this aluminum channel with diffuser. I'll talk a little more about selecting the number of pixels a little bit later in the video, but by keeping my number of pixels under 40, I'll be able to power the whole system off this single wall wart, which is a 5 volt, 3 amp power supply. If you go over 40 pixels, you may have to upgrade to a little bit beefier power supply, something like this. I'll be using an Electro Cookie prototype board to mount my components, and I'll be putting that inside of the 3D printed enclosure. But again, you don't have to have a 3D printer for this project. Uh, you can use a plastic project box, an old soap dish. There are a lot of options for that. And I'll have a, a link in my parts list to an example project box for this. Of course, you're going to need wire. And I'm going to use some wiring connectors like barrel connectors and JST connectors. You'll see those throughout the project. And I will have a complete parts list of everything I used in my project down in the video description and in my related blog article. But the one item I haven't talked about yet is my distance sensor. In my case, I'm using a TF-Mini-S LiDAR distance sensor. And if you look this up, you'll see that this is easily the most expensive single part of the entire project, costing around $40. So before I ever begin the project, I decided to see if I really needed to spend $40 on a distance sensor. To see if the more expensive TF-Mini-S is really needed for this project, I've decided to do a side-by-side -side test and compare it to a couple of other lower cost options. So here in the middle, I've got the TF-Mini-S, and again, that's around $40. And I'm going to compare that to the VL53LOX Time of Flight sensor that cost around $6, and the HCSR04 ultrasonic sensor that cost around $3. Now to test these, what I've done is taken all three sensors and I've connected them to a single ESP32. And just in case you're curious, the VL53LOX uses I2C to communicate. The TF-Mini-S uses UART or Serial for its communications. And the HCSR04 uses two GPIO pins to send out a trigger to one pin and then measure the time it takes to come back as an echo on another pin. I've just placed some simple Arduino code on the ESP32, and what it's going to do is once per second, it's going to take a measurement from all three sensors. I'm going to let that run for around three minutes at various distances. And what I'm looking for is somewhat with the accuracy of the distance, but more importantly, the precision or the stability of that distance measurement. What I don't want is I don't want a distance signal that's going to bounce all over the place especially as the car is approaching the final park spot, we need a stable signal in terms of our distance measurement. So we'll line all these up, we'll take some measurements, we'll come back and see whether the $40 TF-Mini-S is really worth the additional cost. Okay, to actually test the sensors, I've decided I'm actually gonna use my car. And so what I've done is I've placed these sensors at a level where it's really looking at a solid part of, of the front of the car. I'll talk more about mounting of the sensor when we get uh, through the actual build. But I'm starting out here again at about, right about 12 inches. But remember we're looking more for stability or precision of the signal than we are a true actual match of the distance. For one thing, the front bumper is curved, so that's automatically gonna add some differences between the sensors. So again, I'm gonna run this for about three minutes then I'll repeat it about five feet out, and again, about 15 feet out. So while I take these reading, let's take a look at some of the specs of the three different sensors. All three sensors will operate off the same five volts as our controller board. The TF-Mini does draw a little bit more current, but all of them are insignificant compared to the current draw of our LEDs. When we take a look at the minimum distance, or the minimum range, the VL53LOX wins by far with a minimum distance range of 50 millimeters or just around two tenths of an inch. The ultrasonic sensor will go down to about three quarters of an inch while the TF-Mini will only measure down to just under a foot. 
Now, as long as you don't need to get your car any closer than about a foot to the sensor, all three will still work. It's when we look at the maximum range that we start to see some real differences. The TOF sensor only has a maximum uh, distance of just of about 3.9 feet, while the ultrasonic sensor will go up to about 13 feet, but our TF Mini will actually go all the way up to 6 meters or around 19.7 feet. It actually has a range that's actually double that, but the accuracy is considerably less at anything under uh, 6 meters. We also look at the measuring angle or the kind of the field of view of each of these and the TOF and the ultrasonic sensor have 25 degree and 15 degree uh, measuring angles. That means if you need to put these near a sidewall, it's possible you'll be getting a, a distance measurement off the sidewall instead of the vehicle. While the TF Mini has a measuring angle of only two degrees, has a very narrow focus. All three of them use different communication protocols, but they each only use two pins on your controller board. And when you look at the cost, there's a significant difference. $3 for the ultrasonic versus six for the time of flight versus a whopping 40 for the TF Mini. So let's take a look at the test results to see if the TF Mini is really worth that extra money. So let's start out by taking a look at the measurements from one foot out. Now I'm not gonna go over all of these numbers. If you're really interested, there are copies of the charts and the full test results in my blog article. So we'll just kind of look at the highlights here. So surprisingly, the VL53LOX, or the time of flight sensor, even though it has the shortest range, happens to be the noisiest at only one foot out. Now that isn't a lot of noise. If you look down there, the variance is still only uh, about 0.4 inches or about a half inch, but there is uh, quite a bit of noise on that compared to both the ultrasonic and the TF Mini at this point. Now you might be asking about the actual average distance, why it is so different. Well, for one, there's no way I could actually assure that all of the actual sensors were precisely lined up on uh, the breadboard. And I also mentioned this in my blog, but the front of my car is curved. So depending on where exactly that sensor is hitting part of that curve, will actually change the distance being measured. But let's go ahead and move on and take a look at the results at five feet. Okay, so here at five feet, right off the get-go, we can see we're already out of range of our time of flight sensor. And we're starting to see a little bit more noise with our ultrasonic sensor. Its variance is now up to about 1.2 inches. That's probably still okay when you're this far out from the final park position. But once again, our TF Mini has a pretty stable signal in this case, it is seeing a little bit of a variance of up to about a half inch. Let's go ahead and back this on out now to 15 feet. So when we get up to 15 feet, you can see that the TF Mini is now the last man standing. And even though it still has a little bit of noise, it's still only about a 1.2 inch variance, even out here at 15 feet, which is about the same that the ultrasonic had at only five feet. So given its range and the stability of its signal, I'm going to opt to use the TF Mini S, even though it costs more money, I think it's the best sensor for this project. Now you're certainly free to try the ultrasonic sensor, especially if you feel like you don't need anything beyond about a 10 or 12 foot range and, and can make a parking zone wide enough to deal with a little bit of noise. But also note that you will have to modify my firmware as it is designed to work with the TF Mini S and is looking for communication on the serial port. But with my decision made to use the TF Mini, let's go ahead and move on to the build of the actual controller itself. Now, just in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through step by step here on how to build that controller. That's available in the written blog article if you're interested. But if you take a look at the wiring diagram, again, you can find a copy of that in the blog. This is very similar to the controller I've built for a lot of my other WLED projects like these lights you see behind me. So if you've seen any of those videos, you'll already be somewhat familiar with this controller. There are a few changes though, and again, those are detailed in the blog. Now, whenever I'm building something for the first time, I actually like to try everything out on a bread bowl before I solder anything. So sorry for the grainy footage here where I'm trying to make it so you can see the LEDs, but I've connected everything together with jumpers and DuPonts and Wago clips and loaded the firmware to give this a try. And I'm actually just using a flat board. You'll actually see my shadow there coming in uh, from the side of the screen, just to make sure everything is working as expected for all of my different zones. And once I assured that everything was working right on a breadboard, at that point, I'm ready to start creating the actual final soldered version of the controller. 
Now I won't make you sit through the agony of, of watching me solder all these components together. As I mentioned, it's very similar to the WLED controller that I've built in other videos. Uh, again, there are a couple differences. Obviously, we're going to connect the TF Mini to our uh, serial ports on our, our D1 Mini. But if you remember at the beginning of the video, I talked about wanting to stay at around 40 uh, LED pixels or under. I'm going to use 36. And in all honesty, I'm only going to run those at no more than about 50% brightness. Part of the reason for that is I'm actually going to run the power for the LEDs through the power rail on the electro cookie board. Now, normally I tell people don't do that because it's not rated to handle the amps. But at only 36 pixels and running at about 50% brightness, I should be only running probably less than 500 milliamps, maybe 750 tops. And just to be as a precaution, I'm actually going to run a wire bridge connection on that power rail on the underneath side. Again, you can look at, uh, at the blog first to see how I did that. Now, if you're going to use anything more than about 40 pixels or you're going to run full bright white or those kind of things, then you need to consider potentially running uh, your power directly from your power supply to your LEDs. And I do cover uh, that option in the blog as well. But with the controller board built, the last thing we need to take a look at is the LEDs and how we're going to connect these all these components together. I've covered LED strips in a lot of my other videos, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. If you've not used uh, 5 volt WS2812B pixel strips before, I have another video that's kind of a beginner's guide. You can take a look at that. But really all I've done is I've cut an aluminum channel to length uh, and the, diff the diffuser for the 36 pixels I'll be using. As always, I like to put this double-sided tape down to make sure my pixels or my strip doesn't come loose. And I've attached my three leads to the LEDs. Again, just making sure I'm connecting these to the data inside of the LED strip and not the data out end. On one end of this, to these leads, I will attach a JST connector. And I will use a JST connector on the other end, which will be my wiring coming from my controller. And just to make everything look neat, I will put it in some wiring sheath like this. And this happens to be the connection for our TF Mini. The TF Mini comes with a connector like this. So what I opted to do was go ahead and cut the end off of that. And I added uh, some DuPont connectors here, kind of built my own. And then we will be able to plug this in. And this will go back to the controller. And finally will be our power supply. Again, uh, what I will do is I will take this. And I will add a barrel connector to one end of this. And a barrel connector to the other end that's going to power the controller and thereby also power a LED strip. So that's all the connections in a nutshell. I'll finish this up, we'll get it mounted, and we'll take a look at the final design. So here's the final version installed in the garage. Note that I've mounted my distance sensor at approximately the same height as the middle part of this solid piece of the bumper on the car. Because remember, the TF Mini only has about a two degree field of view, so it's a pretty narrow beam. Obviously my controller's here. Now this could be mounted anywhere, but obviously you need to change your wiring length. In fact, I have a little bit too much wire here. If I were to uh, make this a permanent install, I'd probably go back and shorten some of these leads. Obviously here's our LED strip. It's mounted to be at about uh, eye level for the driver when they're approaching. And of course our connection for the LED strip. Now, as I mentioned before, everything is built so that it can easily be taken apart and plugged back together. So we're using four pin DuPont connectors for our sensor, barrel connectors for our power supply, and JST connector over here for our LED strip. So now that it's all built, let's actually jump in the car and give it a test. Okay, we'll give this a try with me filming while I'm trying to drive. Uh, I don't know how well it's gonna work. The camera's probably gonna be a little bit bouncy, but you can see the system's currently asleep or in standby mode. As I begin to pull into the garage, you see now it has hit the wake zone, so now the system comes alive. As I continue to pull forward, you can see it's now starting to track my distance towards my final parking spot. I continue to approach and get the countdown, and when the lights turn red, I'm in the proper spot. Now, if I do happen to pull too far forward, it's going to start flashing at me to back up. Simply put the car in reverse and back up until the lights turn solid once again. So everything seems to be working. Uh, I have to adjust the distances a little bit, but I'm pretty happy with it. 
So for one final test, I want to compare my new version to my original Raspberry Pi version. Now, even back in the day when you could find and buy Raspberry Pis for reasonable costs, the cost of that project with the LED matrix, they both use a TF Mini, but the cost of a Raspberry Pi SD card and case versus the cost of a D1 Mini, and the cost of that LED matrix panel versus the cost of 30 or 40 uh, WS2812B pixel strips means the Raspberry Pi project was two to three times more expensive than this new version. But let's compare them side by side. Well, there you have it. The new system is almost identical in terms of functionality to the original Raspberry Pi version, but also adds a nice web interface where you can manage and change your options and settings. And just a reminder to check the video description, which will contain links to a blog article for all the physical build details and to a GitHub repo that will contain the firmware, plus a wiki that will describe all of the settings and options, including instructions on how to install the firmware. So that's going to do it for this video. As always, if you found anything you liked, do me a favor and hit that like button. Click the subscribe button if you'd like to see more of my videos and ding that little bell icon if you want to be notified when I release new content. As always, I'd like to say thank you for watching and I hope to see you soon.